Welcome to Municipal Affairs, a groundbreaking new show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. Now, we're excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders and municipal stakeholders from coast to coast to coast. Today on the show, the Reeve of Vulcan County, Alberta, gives his insights on the pause on new renewable energy projects in the province of Alberta and what it means particularly for his rural municipality. Then, last week, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities met virtually to discuss the key priorities of municipalities. Now, this meeting was expected to be in Yellowknife, but due to the wildfires earlier in August, the board meeting was moved virtually. Then, the topic of strategic planning has been coming up a lot on our sister show, Cross Border Interview. So, we spoke with Strategic Steps Incorporated President Ian McCormack about what goes into a strategic priority for a municipality. And finally, one of the last remaining communities that prohibits the sale of alcohol in Alberta has ended the prohibition of alcohol sales in the small Alberta town of Cardston. But first, In a surprising move earlier in August, Alberta's provincial government announced a temporary pause on approvals of renewable power projects. This decision, which was made on August 3rd, is part of a broader effort, according to the Alberta government, to conduct an inquiry into the regulations surrounding renewable energy production in the province. Now, the primary goal of this inquiry is to ensure that the right processes are in place to support and continued investment in Alberta's renewable energy sector. Now, to facilitate this comprehensive review, the Alberta government directed the Alberta Utilities Commission to halt approvals of renewable power projects until February 29th, 2024. The decision aims to create a level playing field for all renewable energy projects in the province, ensuring that they adhere to consistent regulations and processes. Nathan Newdorf, the Minister of Affordability and Utilities in the province of Alberta, explained, quote, This approach will provide future renewable investments with the certainty and clarity required for long-term development, end quote. Now, the pause in approvals is seen as a necessary step to streamline regulations and promote a stable environment for renewable energy investments in Alberta. One region in Alberta significantly affected by this temporary halt in approvals is Vulcan County. This area is known for hosting one of the largest solar farms in North America, as well as one of Western Canada's largest wind farms, among other renewable energy projects. Now, the pause on approvals has raised questions and speculation within Vulcan County, prompting local leaders to reflect on its implications for their communities. Now, today, we had the opportunity to chat with Vulcan County Reeve, Jason Snyder, to gain insights into the county's perspectives on this development and what they will hope will come from the regulatory review. As Alberta grapples with the balance between renewable energy expansions and regulatory oversights, Vulcan County stands at the forefront of this critical conversation. Reeve, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I, I want to start with the basic question here, and I apologize to make it sound like a two-year-old asking the question, but I think I need to to set up the context of where Vulcan County is coming from about their uh, their their a stance on the pause of renewable energy uh, projects in the province of uh, Alberta today. Um, where does the county stand on this pause? Well, we're we're very happy that the province is uh, taking a deeper look at uh, some of the issues. Uh, the wind and solar industry has. Uh, um, it's really moved very quickly for an industry over the last 10 years. Uh, the scope and the scale of these projects has just absolutely exploded. So uh, there's definitely been some uh, issues that we've been 
uh, asking questions about with the province as well as the ratepayers in our area. So uh, we are happy to hear that uh, you know they are finally taking a step back and trying to uh, uh, look at you know some solutions to make sure that this uh, this industry is long term viable in southern Alberta. Um, you know, we, we weren't advocating for a six month pause. I know that that does put some pressure on on some developers who are, you know, mid project or just about at that point of putting in an application. But uh, I, I think from everything that we've heard from the province, I, I understand why they've they're doing the pause, but uh, we're, you know, obviously we're, we're hoping that we can, we can get this, uh, this pause over with and it can go back to business and we can keep, uh, you know, we can get some of these projects off the ground, uh, especially the ones that, that really are beneficial for the, uh, for our community. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I believe the biggest issue that you had and the reason why you were so, adv uh, you were advocating for uh, the change in legislation was the reclamation part of the scenario. And that would probably be the big thing I want to talk about a little bit here. Um, you have seen through other rural municipalities about the reclamation process when it comes to the oil and gas sector and how municipalities are left holding the bag and help left holding the, uh, not with the money that they need from from oil and gas companies. Is it similar what you're asking for from the renewable energy sector as well to say, we want you here. We believe that Vulcan County has a place for you here, but we need some safeguards to make sure that our residents aren't holding the bag. Yeah, that's that's a great way to uh, to phrase it. Uh, pretty much every resource extraction uh, um, <laughs> industry, it's the, the the way in Alberta we kind of do it is you know uh, bankruptcy is the cheapest reclamation plan, right? You you uh, you you, uh, you you mine it, you you pump that well as long as you can, and then you you sell it to a shell corporation, and then magically that shell corporation uh, goes bankrupt, and then yeah, it's it's the municipality and it's the taxpayers, it's it's the local taxpayers, it's the provincial, it's the federal taxpayers. That are now now cleaning up a mess, and and uh, you know that's that really doesn't sit well uh, even with the residents in our areas. Uh, you know, if you're going to profit off Alberta's resources, whether that's you know wind, solar, gravel, uh, oil and gas, it doesn't matter what it is. You, you need you need to have those uh, mechanisms in place to uh, clean up when you're done. And uh, you know the the only difference with the the discussion about wind and solar is we're having it. Kind of at the beginning, as opposed to with oil and gas, you know, we we're having that conversation forty years too late. Like this, this should these are the conversations we should have been having in the seventies and eighties, saying like, you know, hey, like, you know, they say they're going to clean up once they're done, but like, how is that going to happen? And then that's that's exactly kind of where where we're at. And and currently, there's no legislation in place uh, when it comes to uh, the reclamation side of uh, wind and solar developments. I, I know some developers, uh, you know, do have those. Uh, those agreements in place they're always private agreements they're always under an nda so nobody nobody gets to see them so um you know i i uh the ones that i've seen uh they vary uh you know there's some that they they don't all oh, the, the reclamation promises basically you know in 30 years we'll clean up and and uh, there's no mechanism for you know how is that going to happen i mean we've seen other ones where they propose you know in in 25 years we'll start putting some money aside and you know that starts to you know kind of go oh, i don't know like is that really like, are you going to clean up and and i i understand that you know the from the industry they're saying well this is a private agreement between private landowners you know this doesn't concern municipalities and uh, you know i understand that sentiment but uh the, the reality is that once these projects get to a certain scale, no private landowner has the ability to clean up should a developer decide to walk away uh, two, three decades down the road. And uh, ultimately what else happens in all of those situations is the landowner walks away from the land as well. And the the financial implications of that, they've been paid enough over the over the 20 years uh, in a lease payment that, you know, if they end up walking away, it's, it's not, uh, you know, they're not really suffering a big financial uh, uh, hit. So, so that, that's our concern. It's just, it's a red flag. We've seen it happen in other industries and we just don't want it to happen again. And uh, you know, these, these projects are, are large uh, dollar projects. And I think part of that should, should include, you know, having those funds guaranteeing to have those funds available uh, for the reclamation so that the, you know, the municipality or, well, sorry, the landowner doesn't get stuck with a big liability. And, and then, you know, hopefully that the municipality doesn't end up with that liability when the landowner walks away. You, you talk about the landowner and the residents of your county and the, the the agreements are signed with the landowner and not with the municipality, which is understandable. But the municipality does have a role to play in changing development, changing bylaws, changing zoning regulations. But I want to talk about the residential aspect here for a second. 
Are you speaking with residents who are echoing the same concerns that you're saying about, yes, we've entered into these agreements, but you're right, we could be left on the hook here where we might have to walk away? Or what are residents in your area in Vulcan County telling you about these renewable projects and the reclamation process or any other concerns that they may have about the renewable energy uh, projects that are coming and they're coming fast? <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 incredible the pace that this has uh, this has all occurred. Um, you, definitely, residents. Uh, every time there's another application, uh, we we hear about the reclamation side of things, and and uh, you know there's there's the people who are you know not part of the project. They definitely have those concerns. But even I've spoken to a few people that that uh, you know are part of these projects, and they they go, well, you know what, you know it's hey, it's it's been dry the last five years in Southern Alberta. Like, I mean, ag agriculture in Southern Alberta has been a little bit of a tough, uh, a tough gig here. And, uh, you know, they go, you know, it's, it's a source of income, you know, where we're going to take our chances. We're going to hope that they live up to these obligations at the end, but you know, it's kind of a, Hey, we, we, we feel it's an opportunity. We're going to, we're going to try to, we're going to take some risk and see what happens. So um, yeah, it's, the, the the advice I usually give to everybody is talk to a lawyer. Like you know, you make make sure you know what you know what you're getting into because uh, uh, some agreements I've seen are are a, are a bit scary and uh, and then like I said, a lot a lot of them are a private contract and uh, you know they they definitely don't make those public. They don't they don't tell anybody what's what's in them. So I, I really hope that people are are being covered because it's you know when you start talking thousands of acres of land being taken up by a development the reclamation costs are going to be substantial. And uh, I, I really hope that, uh, you know, I, I hope we're just being paranoid. I mean, I've, I've definitely been accused of being, a, you know, a, a just be doom and gloom and saying like, well, you're only thinking about the bad aspects, but I've, I've been a municipal councillor long enough to know that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, the worst case scenario does happen more often than it really should. So, uh, you know, if you plan for the worst and it doesn't happen, well, I, I'll happily be wrong in 30 years when all these, you know, if, if they're no longer economically viable to run and they're all cleaned up and it goes back to farmland, uh, I will happily, uh, happily be wrong. But um, just, just the amount of red flags so far this this is just echoing oil and gas this is echoing the gravel industry where <laughs> you know so I, I really don't think i'm being i don't think i'm being unreasonable or i don't think as a county we're being unreasonable just asking for these uh these and and we are by no means trying to stop this industry this wind and solar development balkan county has been has been a very positive thing overall um some of the developers that we've worked with so far have been absolutely amazing they have worked with the community they've worked with the people in the area to address these concerns um but the last two years it's been a bit of a gold rush uh there's i i don't even know how many developers right now are are working on projects i bet you yeah, I mean, it changes every every two days. There's someone dropping off a business card saying they've either acquired a project or they're going to try to build up a project. Like, I it has become an absolute gold rush. So, uh, it's definitely heightened our concern uh, that you know now we have we have people who have never never done a development period in any industry, uh, and now they're looking at large scale uh, you know energy development. Um, so. Um, Thankfully, the province probably also saw the explosion in applications, and maybe that's what really spurred them on to to finally make a change. Because I've I've literally talked with, uh, I think, I mean, I, I talked with Jim Prentice about this issue. <laughs> like, it, this has been this has been going on a while. I I mean, we've we've changed governments many times, and I think they've all all were aware that the lack of regulations was you know was a potential issue down the road but nobody knew what to do with it and i think everyone was very concerned that you know we we, we they didn't want to uh they didn't want to come out you know again anti wind and solar and they were very concerned about that perception but ultimately i, I think we can we can achieve both of those objectives you know we can we can make this and in, this industry can continue to thrive southern alberta is a great place to do business uh it's got great wind and solar resources and you know if everybody's protected i mean i i think it's really a win-win for everyone and you when you address those concerns i think you're even going to get better buying from the residents uh when, when they don't have these uh, outstanding concerns so what, what does Vulcan County want from the provincial government over the next six months? Because we are a month into this seven month pause for a renewable energy project. What, what What is Vulcan County specifically looking for? You talk about the reclamation, that's one part, but that can't be all because that, that seems like a no brainer. But there must be other issues that you're seeing that you want addressed in this review of uh, renewable energy projects. 
yeah, so reclamations uh, is at the top of the list, but also at the top of the list is, is it's just um, respecting the land use planning that municipalities do. Uh, we, we're the ones who are trying to balance uh, a lot of uh, competing interests. I mean, we're balancing agriculture, uh, recreation, residential, industrial, commercial, energy development, oil and gas, gravel. Like we, we, we have so many things that we're trying to balance. And the way that municipalities do that is through the land use planning. We, we spend countless dollars and countless hours working on these documents to try to, to bring a balance and to make sure that everybody, you know, every, you know, everybody, everybody can coexist peacefully. And, you know, we're not having a, you know, we're not having a feedlot right beside a nursery school, right? Like we're, we're trying to, we're trying to, you know, that's an extreme example, but we're trying to create that, that balance. And it's, it's extremely frustrating um, when the province makes decisions that they believe are in the best, uh, best interest of the province and of, uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, we we have a large scale energy development in the middle of an area where, you know, it was like, well, that's, you know, we have, <laughs> it's it's heavy agriculture, it's prime farmland, and now we have, we, you know, we have thousands of acres of solar panels right in the middle of it. And so the 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 request really is that we we need to we need to be at the table when when these decisions are being made and and making good decisions because I mean we've seen examples of we have we have projects that they need 30 kilometers of transmission line built to them. And you know, you go, well, wouldn't wouldn't a reasonable person go, here's an idea, why don't you move it 30 kilometers closer to the transmission lines other than having to build 30 kilometers of transmission lines. And then the fun fact in Alberta is us as uh, taxpayers, we pay for those transmission lines. Those those aren't built by the developer. Those are paid for by Alberta taxpayers. So it, it's those it's those little nuances that nobody really thought about. I mean, nobody nobody expected to have you know 100, 200, 400 megawatt projects uh, out in the middle of Vulcan County. So uh, it's just those things that we 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 need a little little better of a voice. Uh, right now we're kind of brushed to the side, and it's kind of given the don't worry, the province knows what they're doing. We got this. Like, you know, you guys just sit back and watch and and we're on the ground going like, I don't think you got <laughs> this. Like, I think, you, like, I think you're kind of uh, scrambling here. So um, yeah, so really it's 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 wanting to be part of it because we, we want them to be successful. I mean, we, the, thankfully the developers that have done the large projects here in Vulcan County, which uh, largest single site uh, wind installation and largest solar project in Canada, the developer was extremely uh, willing to work with the county and willing to work with residents to address those concerns. You know, maybe let's make sure it's near transmission. Let's make sure that we don't have to build roads. Let's make sure we're not running by people's houses at all hours of the night, hauling, you know, a million solar panels. And like they, they checked all those boxes and it was great, but you know, that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean the next guy is going to do the same thing. So uh, unfortunately you do have to put in legislation or you have to build rules for the, for the developers who, you know, aren't so concerned about being a community member. Um, so yeah, that, that's really, you know, between reclamation and, and kind of those land use uh, matters, like I discussed, I think those are really kind of the number one and number two. And, and I, and I really don't think, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm being, maybe we're being unreasonable here, but I, I think they're both, that I, I think they're both pretty reasonable asks, and I don't think that either of them, you know, kills an industry. I, I, I think it, I think ultimately, if nothing, it actually helps the industry long term as much as they might not agree with me right now is, you know, if you can get the public on side with these projects, these projects go so much more smoothly when, when it's a fight and it's an appeal and there's lawyers involved, these projects turn absolutely into a gong show. But, um, you know, if you can, if you can uh, address this, or I guess be required to address these before the application even goes into the AUC, these projects can actually go pretty smoothly and, and get the community buy-in. And we've, we've seen that with some of the projects we've seen, uh, we, we've had people show up to talk in support of projects, which people just don't do. You know, when there when there's a planning decision, you know, the people who are angry show up, but the people who like it never show up. And and literally, we've we've had ones that the community got so invested into a project that they were, you know, they they were showing up to remind us that uh, you know this they they really wanted this, and these guys had done done right by them. I have two last questions, and I, I, I'm going to ask the political question here first, and I apologize for putting you on the spot here, but we are over a month into this pause. Uh, the provincial government said it's going to uh, review and look at uh, the areas, the legislation. Has anyone from the province reached out to Vulcan County to discuss their concerns with them? 
Uh, not, not directly at this point. Uh, um, we, we have had contact with the uh, AUC, just kind of checking in to see how to, to make sure that uh, we're being contacted, being, being a little proactive, and and they, they're just kind of working through that process of how they're going to do that consultation. So uh, I guess uh, we will see, but uh, I, I think I think that as a municipality, we have a lot to, we have a lot to offer. Um, in the last ten years here, uh, we've seen some of the largest developments uh, in Canada be done in our borders. So um, you know we've learned some lessons and. Uh, We've we've been successful, uh, and so I think we have I, I think we have something to add. So uh, I, I guess maybe our approach is we're we're, we're going to keep knocking on the door and uh, <laughs> and make sure that we're part of this, as as I think industry should too. I I, I fully think that if you, you you know you need all the perspectives there in order to come up with some some good uh, legislation. My last question is about the people, the residents of your community probably rely uh, on some of these projects, whether it be for work, whether it be through business opportunities, because if when a development comes in, they hire local and then therefore it spurs the economy. This pause is probably kind of pigeonholed the county a little bit, not a lot, but probably a little bit in some of the businesses that it's going that's going on in the community. Uh, is seven months too long for the county to sort of weather this uh, pause? No, uh, I, I mean, the, the reality The reality is that uh, these projects, I mean, these take mul multiple years to to do. I mean, I, I think most are four to five years from from planning concept to actually being into production. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with supply chain. I mean, if you, you know, you to, to build a million and a half panels, you know, you, 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 you know, you gotta be, you gotta be planning ahead. So uh, I, of, of all the projects that are, are uh, in progress here, uh, this doesn't actually, uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't affected any of them. Uh, they are all, they are all still, uh, working uh, towards that. Uh, a lot of them already do have that AUC approval. And then, I mean, from the time you get the AUC approval, I mean, you've still got multiple years before you're actually in uh, progress. Uh, and then, then the other thing is like, we probably have seven projects that are approved and haven't broken ground yet. So they're all kind of waiting for, you know, either an investor or waiting for the supply chain to catch up. So um, I don't, I, I don't see it really having, uh, it, it hasn't stopped any projects uh, uh, to my knowledge, um, but uh yeah, it, the ones the ones that it impacts are the ones that are you know where you know two weeks from uh, you know pressing the send button on the application you know now they have to wait seven months for an approval. But um, once once again the AUC did make that uh, that new change here with uh, with their directive 007, and uh, it's it's actually allowing them to go through the whole process. They just won't get a yes or no until uh, uh, you know the. So I guess six months from now. So, um, so I guess time time will tell. But uh, so far, I haven't had anybody you know call up and say, "Hey, this killed our project." It's most of them are you know most of them are still you know trudging along and uh, and uh, fall, going through the process. We uh, we've even got some that are still scheduling open houses here in the next little while. So it, it does seem like they are they are uh, they are continuing down that path. And uh, I guess they're they must be somewhat optimistic that you know the rules coming in uh, you know won't won't kill their project. Uh, because they, they are spending still spending money getting the project uh, going okay i know i said that was my last question but you just said a word that i want to pick up on here for one second you said optimistic are you optimistic that this review this pause is going to uh, identify and change the legislation that will benefit the vulcan county and communities and residents uh, when it comes to the reclamation and the by uh, the land use i am uh and that's uh uh, it's hard to be optimistic. I, I've been a council now for ten years. I've dealt with uh, <laughs> a multiple different premiers uh, and uh, you know different governments, and uh, I've had my heart broken many times. But uh, I am very, uh, I am very optimistic. Though um, I, I've had the opportunity to. Uh, to um, meet with uh, Minister uh, Nathan Newdorf and, as well as uh, be at a few meetings where he's uh, spoken on this and 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 I, I I think that he really is grasping some of the issues and this is complex this isn't this is there are so many moving pieces in this thing this is this isn't a this isn't a thirty second soundbite this is a you know an hour long conversation on this and and I I think he really does grasp that and I think he understands why this is important to to get this right so uh, I'm I'm more optimistic than I probably normally am and uh 
And, uh, you know, I, I really hope that they they do get this right because it's important. It's important for the industry. It's important for municipalities. It's important for all Albertans. So it's a, it's a big task. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, as a minister, he's, uh, I think he he's up to the task uh, from from all the conversations and and what I what I've heard from him. So, Reeve, I want to thank you so much for doing this, sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule. I know I said fifteen minutes and we're at the half hour mark, but that's the great thing about this conversation. It's not just a thirty second soundbite, like you said. Yeah, and that, and that's the thing is it's it's such a complex conversation, and uh, you know I, I'm I'm happy to have these conversations because uh, you know we we've been very um, fortunate to have some of these developments. Uh, they've they've really uh, as a municipality they've they've literally filled that gap that oil and gas uh, as it went away. Um, renewables has filled that gap so we've been very fortunate and you know I'm, I'm happy to you know to share our experiences and talk about you know what why it's been great for us but then also talk about you know why we also have concerns and uh yeah it's everybody I talk to it it's, it's always an hour-long conversation and uh yeah my, my wife gets uh, getting frustrated because I'm like oh just a quick call here and an hour later I'm talking about land use planning it matters and but uh, no it's, it's all good I, I, I appreciate you uh you having me on and uh having this conversation because uh, it well, is well I, I will reach out in six months time once the pause is lifted and see what the follow-up and see if you're happy with the recommendations or any changes that they've uh, announced so thank you so much reef you bet thank you the Federation of Canadian Municipalities recently conducted a virtual board meeting against the backdrop of national challenges underscoring the resilience of leadership demonstrated by municipalities across this great country. The meeting began with a reflection of the most recent wildfire crisis in the Northwest Territories, which led the relocation of the Board of Directors meeting from Yellowknife to a more virtual setting. Now, according to the FCM, municipalities consistently find themselves at the forefront of responding to these crises, irrespective of jurisdiction. This reality prompted an important motion adopted by the FCM Board of Directors during the meeting, calling on the federal government to take decisive action. Federation of Canadian Municipalities President Scott Pierce said this motion calls upon the federal government to take critical action, including expediting the development of a Canadian wildland fire prevention and mitigation strategy and increasing investments in the Disaster Mitigation Adaption Fund. As the Canadian Parliament sets to resume this week, FCM board members, through their work of standing committees, reviewed the organization's current advocacy priorities. Foremost among these are the national housing crisis. While numerous Canadians struggle to secure safe and affordable housing, municipalities are actively working to create conditions conducive to building while still adhering to responsible planning and delivering essential infrastructure to support increased housing supply. The FCM Board of Directors also called on the need for a new municipal growth framework, emphasizing the need to align municipal revenue with population growth, economic expansion as well. President Scott Pierce is quoted to say, FCM boards view that now is the time for a truly national conversation about the future growth of Canadian municipalities and the tools that they need to meet interrelated challenges and opportunities that come with it. For too long, cities and communities have worked within an outdated framework that limits their ability to respond to the expanding set of local responsibilities that Canadians expect and deserve from their local government, the order of a government closest to their daily lives. FCM is currently urging all levels of government to engage in a national conversation around this issue. This conversation aims to redefine collaboration and explore new tools for better linking municipal revenue to Canada's growth. Cross-Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross-Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard. 
and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. After more than a century of being one of Alberta's last remaining dry towns, Cardston, Alberta has decided to lift its alcohol prohibition laws in a landmark town council vote last Tuesday. In a momentous decision, Cardston's town council voted 5-2 to two in favor of ending the blanket ban on alcohol sales, which had been in place for an astounding 121 years. Now, the vote marks a significant departure for the town's long-standing tradition of prohibition and comes after extensive community discussions and even public hearings and a plebiscite. Dozens of residents and local business owners gathered for the public hearing to voice their opinions on this matter last Tuesday. The 3,700-person community, predominantly Mormons, found itself divided over the issue. Concerns about drunk driving and the potential negative impact on the town's moral and social fabric were voiced by some residents, reflecting the deep-seated traditions that had upheld the prohibition for generations. However, others in attendance argued in favor of the economic benefits that could be delivered from allowing alcohol sales in the town. They anticipated a boost in the local economy through increased tourism and sales revenue, which would have a positive impact on Cardston's business and services, according to some participants. The historic vote represents a significant shift in the culture and economic landscape of Cardston. As the town moves forward into a new era, it will be closely watched to see how the changes impact the community's dynamic and local businesses. After the vote was taken, Cartston Mayor Maggie Crone said that the change can sometimes be difficult. One of the two nay votes came from Councillor Granger, who said prior to the vote that he opposed the vote and his decision didn't come lightly. Councillor Jensen, who voted yes to the motion, said that she did it due to her commitment to the community. When the plebiscite happened in 2014, she committed to voting the way the plebiscite went, even 
if it was against her own opinion. Cardston, Alberta, Mayor Cronin said that when she ran, she ran on the understanding that if a moral decision was put forward to council, she would seek residents' input on the issue. The 5-2 vote was based on allowing liquor services at restaurants and recreational facilities, including a local golf course. On the flip side, bars, clubs, liquor stores, and other liquor primary businesses are still not allowed to set up shop in the community. And after last Tuesday's vote by Cardston Council, the towns of Sterling, Alberta and Raymond, Alberta, remain the sole two communities left with a prohibition on alcohol sales in their communities. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most, in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together, we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. Now, occasionally on this show, we are going to be diving into some municipal education, if you will, with some of the big issues that we're hearing about on our shows. And now, over the last three weeks, our sister show, Cross Border Interviews, has been graced by the presence of municipal leaders from across Canada, who have all shared their insightful perspectives on the strategic priorities laid out by their respective communities. Now, these strategic priorities are not just buzzwords. They are guiding principles that shape the future of all municipalities. So today, we have a distinguished guest on our show, an expert in the field of strategic planning, someone who can help us dive deeper into the important subject. Joining us for an intimate conversation is Ian McCormick, president of Strategic Steps Incorporated. Ian, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It's always great to chat with you with all of our other show and everything else. A good friend of mine to come on the show and talk about strategic planning is always appreciative. Uh, I, wa I want to start with the basic uh, question here, Ian, and that is, what is a strategic plan? Uh, we're hearing it a lot on the cross-border interviews, so I want to get someone who knows what they are and what they mean from someone I can trust. So, Ian, what is a strategic plan? 
Well, thanks for that, for trusting, Chris. It's good to be actually on your show for a, for a change too. Yeah, we do a lot of strategic planning and uh, a lot. Of, most of the work we do is strategic planning in the local government realm. So it's quite relevant. The idea of a strategic plan to me anyway is a collective expression of the will of the council over the course of their term and beyond. Uh, I constantly tell ask councillors or tell councillors my, that my assumption is that they ran for office in the first place because they're on some sort of a mandate for change, whether that's big or small. But nobody wants to keep the place exactly the same. And sometimes they have to respond to crises or whatever gets downloaded to them from the feds or the province or the territory. But really, the expression, the collective expression is through that strategic plan. And it because, because it's public facing, it also provides a little bit of transparency and some accountability for people as well. The idea behind the strategic plan, because these people are governors, not managers, is to look a long way into the future. So we're not looking at a strategic plan about what we're going to do next week or next year. We're looking at a strategic plan about what we're going to start during this council's term, maybe what we'll finish, but ultimately what it is that makes this place a great place to live for your grandkids or a generation from now is often why, what I use in terms of the longevity of, a, of the strategic plan. One of the reasons why this topic has been sort of prominent in my mind over the last few weeks is uh, most of the municipal councillors that I've been speaking to are from the province of Ontario. They were just reelected or elected to their term a, a, a year ago, and they're going into their first budget session, and they're talking about uh, they're going into a strategic planning session as well. What should come first in, in the municipal realm? Should a strategic plan, particularly in a new council like this, you're one year in, should they be looking at a strategic plan before even considering what a budget is because they go hand in hand? Or I'm, I'm at basically asking which comes first, the chicken or the egg here. But for in your mind, as a consultant for municipalities, what should come first, the strategic plan or the budget? Sure. Well, I won't equivocate on this. It, it doesn't go either way. To me, the chicken comes first. And I mean, by chicken, I mean the strategic plan, because it is the expression of what this council, the stamp that the council wants to put on the municipality. And then the budget becomes a part of how do we actually do that? So the strategic plan is all about what? What's the same? What's different? What are we doing? How do we get it done? Is through the budget. So it's a good time to do a strategic plan as a new council six months to a year in when you kind of understand what's going on. But before you are tied into a budget, and this being their second budget for those in Ontario, this is the budget for halfway through their term, which now means if they waited till next year to do a strategic plan, they're three quarters of the way through their term, essentially. And so it really becomes difficult to see a whole lot happen. So I think the budget, the budget follows the strategic plan. But we also know that the strategic plan is only a minor part of what their municipality does. It's, it's council's priorities. But in reality, uh, we did a strategic plan in Cranbrook in BC not that long ago, and the city manager said, you know, this really only represents like 15% of the work we do is associated with this. The other 85% of the work, uh, keeping the streets plowed or keeping recreational programs going or social services available or insurance paid and fleets updated, that's 85% of our work that's ongoing. Both of those show up in the budget. But only the strategic plan is really about change. So I think if you don't lead with the strategic plan, it's kind of putting the cart before the horse in, in this case. Without uh, giving trade secrets here, Ian, I, I want to know what goes into a strategic plan. You talk about the longevity, about where you want to see the the, uh, the municipality or the town or the village in in four years or in your time in office. But what actually is involved in a strategic planning session because uh I, I as a former municipal employee i've been in some that have just been council and i've seen some that are being council and administration for you what makes a good strategic plan for a municipality of any size sure well the core of it and acknowledge that there's a lot more bits and pieces you can bolt on but if you're doing a strategic plan quite soon after an election, you have a pretty good understanding of the will of the people who elected you. So I don't think there's a ton of uh, effort that has to go into engagement on a strategic plan that's in the first year of a term, for example. The further you get away from an, an election, maybe more public engagement has to happen in advance. But in reality, I kind of break strategic planning down into three phases. Where have we been? Where are we now? And where are we going? So to put that informed life. So most municipalities will probably have an existing strategic plan, one that was handed forward from the last council. So let's have a look at that one. 
uh, I tell people, let's not throw babies out with bathwater. And because this thing is uh, is a, ge a generational plan, perhaps, and certainly about governance, there may be some good stuff in that existing plan that still needs to be done. The last council also had to deal with things like COVID, which is probably through their own plan out the window, but it still means that's, that work can be done. So the looking back piece, I think, is really important to learn from that, to celebrate it, all that kind of thing. In terms of where we are right now, I think it's important to understand the position of the municipality. Some of that would be budgetary, financial. Some of that would be social and cultural. How does the municipal government contribute to the overall well-being of the people who live there? What makes this place a good place to move to and to live in? Those kind of things. Also looking at outside factors. So if we say we've got a pandemic, well, what kind of impact is that going to have on us? We have high interest rates as we speak. What kind of an impact is that going to have with us? Commodity prices, depending on whatever the economy of the area is, all have to be taken into effect. So when you look at where we've been and where you are, you can start looking forward. And I am a proponent, actually, I wrote about this in my first book about uh, cascading alignment. So we need to have a, a clear picture that goes right from the vision of the municipality, which is owned by council. Vision meaning what's our definition of success maybe in a generation? Who do we as, uh, aspire to be? Through vision, through the mission, which is kind of how you get to, to, to vision, to values, our decision-making filter. And then those kind of pieces go together. And from that, we start looking at the things we want to do, changes that we want to make. Because this is a governance plan, it should be about change and it should be about looking big. However, those big things, say an efficient transportation system, doesn't tend to show up in a campaign brochure. So we can take a few of those efficient, we can take deal with potholes, uh, asset management plans, uh, make sure the sewer system that is, is expanded into the new industrial area, put those things together bump it up and now we can start start to talk about efficient infrastructure or efficient transportation which is the goal what do we want to see change and from below that then it's some of those tactics the, just the kind of things i referred to but the goals properly are owned by council the tactics how do we do what council wants is more properly owned by administration through a corporate plan or an operational plan or department plans or whatever and then from that of course is the feedback loop onto setting performance measures so how do we know if we've been successful with the tactics? How do we know if we've been successful with the goals? The whole thing then forms a big loop. Budget is then tied into it as well. So we also say that this is a, because this is a long term plan. When you're creating it, let's look at the first year. What are your priorities? What's important? What's timely? Of all the stuff you want to do within that first year, let's focus on that, knowing that there's always more work to do than resources available to do it. And then we talk about check-in cycles as well. So you don't want to develop this plan in your first year, look at it again in your fourth year and say, well, how come we didn't look at this more often? So uh, the regular check-ins, whether it's with council on everything, whether it's with council on just their priorities, whether it's reprioritizing once a year or so, and then the handoff then to the CAO and to other people within. So that's the non-magic part. The magic part is how well the team works together to to generate that collective expression of success, which is really what the plan is. You talk about checking in with the strategic plan. Now, this 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 uh, this the strategic plan part of the show is based on some of the conversations I've had with Ontario municipal leaders. Now, in Alberta, which we're both from, we are seeing the midterm cycle of a, uh, a term. So we're two years into uh, the last, since the last election, two years to the next election. Is this the time where municipalities need to start pulling that uh, document off the shelf if it's been sitting there, if it hasn't been put front and center during the uh, council meetings, and looking at revamping and seeing the sort of where we are, where we're now, and where we want to be if we're not running for re-election? in two years I think so I think it's an, I think it's an advisable exercise every year to reset those priorities because you look at the first year then we can look back at that first year what did we learn what did we get done then you can look ahead to resetting priorities for the second year you can do that again and again and again like three times now could develop the plan review 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 election so you have that thing ongoing and it's really good for senior managers as well because they kind of know what they ought to be working on. And frequently, I've seen a goal show up in a CAO contract that says, the CA, how well has the CAO advanced the strategic plan, which, of course, makes it fascinating to them. And so the, you, you do see this happen. Right now, we're in uh, we're in fall, which is typically back from back to school. We just actually wrote a blog post about back to school in a metaphorical sense. 
but this is the ideal time to be setting priorities for next year even if you're even if you've got an existing plan because that way again I, I talk about budget being a fiscal manifestation of priorities, meaning you, you put your money where to the thing places you're going to get the most bang or the places you have to do it as a as a regulatory compliance exercise, those sort of things. But still, even if you didn't have a strategic plan, you put your money to the things that are important. But I think the strategic plan gets you a better sense of success and it cascades, too. So if the strategic plan is rolling on our, on an annual basis then chances are in many municipalities that corporate plan they've got is also rolling on an annual basis as well. So that in as much as council's checking in, administration is also checking in because resources to be spent on some of those things I mentioned earlier still are limited. So we, we've got to be careful with the money that you have available and the time and the political capital and the people and all those other resources that you've got to use. Uh, you you've probably done this longer than I can imagine, but you've probably seen good strategic plans and you've probably have seen bad strategic plans. Now, this is a double edit question, so I'm going to ask you the good one first and the bad one second. But what makes a good strategic plan for municipalities? Uh, I think one that's truly sticks to the strategic one that stays in the governance realm and doesn't delve too far into tactics because councillors may or may not have a good idea of how to get stuff done. They just know what, what what should be done. And if tactics show up in a strategic plan as mandatory and we're doing the wrong thing very well, but we're not getting, so that way we're not getting towards the goals that you're looking for. Other things that I kind of look for are brevity, that if we, we used to do really long strategic plans, but we've got down to much shorter ones because I think they're more easily consumed by council, by the public, by anybody who wants to look at them. It also, if they are more, if they're higher level plans, it also gives administration the ability to use their own expertise within the civic administration to figure out how best to deliver these things. And so it's better for a transparency perspective. People might actually look at the darn things. I, I saw that it was a, there was a mayor I've dealt with before who had a strategic plan on a essentially a pocket-sized strategic plan. She pulled it out and she folded up the unfolded the accordion document, which was just like a little pocket-sized thing. That was great. And so they can, can they can refer to this, they can show it to people, and it helps helps council focus and helps administration focus. So to me, those that's what shows up in a good strategic plan. What shows up in a bad strategic plan? I've got to ask. The, I've, got to, no. I've got to ask that question. Yeah, sure. A bad strategic plan is just a to-do list. Uh, it's a, a list of very tactical things that okay. we, uh, we we want to pave Main Street. We want to fix the potholes. We have to reach an agreement with the agricultural society. Uh, we have to, uh, I don't know, prevent tax increases or something to that effect. None of which are outcomes. They're all to do, so they're outputs if you get them done. And there's no real focus to it that says this is what makes this is what we're we're aiming towards making our community better in the long run, and these things are all tied towards that focus. So you're in a bad plan; it's tactical and and very scattered, and really hard for administration to implement or even to understand where the area of focus is. And some of them can be pretty dense in terms of text as well, which makes them intimidating for people to read. However. The worst strategic plans are the ones that don't exist at all. And it's not uncommon for those to show up. And in that case, we just default to budget to say that's your strategic priorities. And so that's really not terribly good either. You talk about the public. And again, this is sort of my last area I want to touch on before we wrap up here, Ian. Um, how important is it their public to have public input on a strategic plan? Because council can sit around a table, council and administration can sit around a table and come up with the strategic priorities and the plan for what they believe. But there has to be buy-in from the residents as well, whether that be what they want to see. And yeah. I'm assuming that's a conduit of why they're, they've been elected. But is there a avenue for the public input for a strategic plan? So in terms of whether the public ought to be involved in the strategic plan, if the plan has been created within a year, say, of an election, you've really had a pretty good plebiscite or referendum on what people want. It's up to council to interpret that into is what they want actually what we ought to be doing. And if so, then let's develop a plan around that. The back end of that is we could test the strategic plan. And we have done that, too, where we have put up poster boards in the, in the rink or had a an open house or a survey to say, are we on the right track here? 
So those are ways that you can involve the public. As we get further and further from an election, however, if we're now developing a strat plan in year two or year three, which is kind of late, but sometimes there is a bridge plan to the next council. In that case, there may be a desire for some input. Now, everybody who has input, well, I shouldn't say everybody, many of the people and organizations who have input are what you might call special interests. It's the library, it's the chamber of commerce, it's the agricultural society, it's uh, education system, those sort of things. So whatever we get in terms of that sort of engagement, we need to take with a bit of a grain of salt and council can put their filter, their political filter, their governance filter over top of that. They can take it, they can leave it, they can adapt it. And ultimately it's up to council to own. So it's council's plan. It's not the municipality's plan necessarily. One of the early questions that I ask in a strategic planning process, however, is whose plan is this? Is this just for the seven of you on council? Is this for the corporation of the town of wherever? Or is this a plan for how the local government can have an impact on the broader community? Almost invariably, it's the last one. But and I, you, your the municipality is limited in their impact, but they can still try. And so that's where a lot of times these strategic plans are. So it's not just about what, what council wants. It's not just about what the corporation wants. It's more about how do we advance the best interests of this community over the long run. How's, how important is it for public to know about the strategic plan as well? I think they should, absolutely should be a public documents. When we do strategic plans, and we I think we did 30 in the last year or so. When we do them, uh, we actually present to council a couple of times. We'll usually go to council shortly after the strategic plan session has been done with a very early draft to say, are we on the right track and should we continue? After that, we will get some feedback, we'll make some changes, and then we typically present the final version of the plan, which is often done in a nice graphic design layout, but not always. And so that plan then goes to council, hopefully to say, yes, we, we agree with this. And then the second piece we say to that is, you probably have a public engagement policy or a communications policy. Now, what are you going to do with this thing to, to shine your light from under the bushel? So, I mean, one of the any of the table stakes pieces is to put it on the website so people can get a hold of it. Others have gone out and spoken to it and the mayor may go out to the service clubs or to a parent council meeting at a school or to wherever chamber of commerce or wherever around town say, this is what the vision we have for the community in the long run is come with us on this journey. So there are various ways of actually doing that, but I do think it's very important that the public at least has access to it. And it's not always the case. I'd say in about a third of the times we do a strategic plan, if we went to look at the municipal website a couple of months later, we wouldn't find that plan. And I don't think that's a great idea. I do. I think for they should actually be posted publicly on the strategic plan, sorry, on the website, and they should be celebrated as well, because there's a lot of effort that goes into it. We usually suggest that it's not only council who does this, participates in the process, that senior managers do as well, and sometimes other people by exception. A municipal clerk, for example, or if there's a, a, a fire chief that they want to have involved, or sometimes the head of the, the, head of the local uh, employees union sometimes is involved too. So those are all pieces that can happen. When it comes to priority setting, however, we also ask the question for all of the people in the room, you guys have helped work on this plan, who should be picking the priorities for the next year? And 50-50, council will say it should just be us because we're the elected reps. Or they say, you know, we all created this plan together. Let's do the priority setting together as well. And the way we do it, we can actually determine what the priorities are for administration, what the priorities are for council, and if there's any difference. Sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. So the public does ultimately need to see this, though. I, I do have one follow-up question sure. that I'm going to ask my last one. Um, we, we're seeing a lot of regionalization going on right now and collaboration between uh, municipalities. Is it important to also bring in neighboring communities to talk about sort of the regional approach for strategic pr priorities and planning, or should that be left up to the sort of larger uh, uh, scenario where you actually do a separate strategic plan for your communities that surround you or encompass you? Yeah, we, we do strategic plans for what we call out here regional service commission sometimes. So water, wastewater, solid waste, emergency services, those sorts of things which are bigger than a single municipality. So we do do those. There's only ever been one strategic plan we have ever worked on that, had, that in which a council has a, invited an elected official from a neighboring municipality to actively participate. 
it was a really neat exercise. Uh, I, that person, I don't think participated in the priority sitting setting part of it, but they were there to kind of bring in the, uh, the, the voice of the surrounding. In, in this case, it was a town and the surrounding rural municipality around it had a representative uh, presence. So be, I, I said earlier, too, about the, the purpose of the strategic plan being broad in that it's how the local government can have an impact on the community. The local government in the town can't have an impact on the local government in the next municipality over. So the plan would not be binding to them. Oftentimes, however, there is a desire right within the strategic plan to say we want to collaborate with our regional neighbors or our indigenous partners or those sorts of other governments and quasi governments that exist. You can't bind them, but you can uh, reach out that hand uh, through the course of the strategic plan. Um, so where can people find out more about strategic steps? Pitch uh, your uh, your company here for a second. Uh, yeah. I know we do we do have our own separate show, the political trenches, local government at work. Uh, but where else can people find out more about or municipal leaders, CAOs who are looking at potentially setting up a strategic planning yeah. session and are looking for someone like your company to come out and help? Sure. Well, first of all, I tell people that we the f- phone calls are free. So if you just have questions. Have a and sometimes I've even been asked to come and present the benefits of having a strategic plan to a council. And if it's a virtual exercise, I'm more than happy to do that for 20 minutes or so. But in terms of where you can find us, uh, strategicsteps.ca is probably the best place, recognizing too that we have people uh, in three different provinces in Alberta, BC, and Newfoundland at the moment. So uh, we can be quite responsive uh, to the to the local needs, and we also understand local legislation as well. So uh, strategic steps start to be probably the best. Way. And you also reference the political trenches podcast as well. Perfect, Ian. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. It's always appreciative to sit down with you and chat municipal governments and strategic planning. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. It's interesting to be on this side of the of the question asking answering cycle as well. So you're welcome. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most, in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. The democratic spirit is alive and well in Alberta as several municipalities gear up for crucial by-elections that will play pivotal roles in shaping local leadership in their own communities. Now, over the next two weeks, communities in various regions of the province will cast their vote in municipal by-elections, ensuring their voices are heard and their representatives are chosen. The town of Clare's home is set to hold its municipal by-election tonight on September 18th. The electoral event carries significant importance for the town as it will determine who will fill the vacant council seat and mayor's chair and guide local decision makings for the next two years. And also on September 18th, tonight, the village of Bittern Lake will also conduct a by-election. Two individuals are running to fill one vacancy on the small village in central Alberta. The Municipal District of Bighorn has its by-election scheduled for Tuesday, September 19th. With various rural concerns in the spotlight, residents of Ward 1 only will have a chance to elect a new councillor. And the Village of Carbon is preparing for its by-election on September 21st. As the tight-knit community gathers to vote, six candidates are eager to address issues of local significance, including community growth, and sustainability. Wrapping up the series of by-elections in the September for the province of Alberta, the summer village of Norglenwood will hold its vote on September 30th. The small lakeside community will decide on its new representative. Three candidates are currently in the hunt for one open vacancy on the summer village council. Now, these upcoming municipal by-elections in Alberta underscore the significance of local democracy and civic engagement. These electoral events provide residents with a platform to voice their concerns and influence the future trajectory of their communities. For up-to-date results, visit the Cross Border Interviews website, and we'll give you the details once we know them. 
That's all for today's Municipal Affairs on this beautiful September 18th, 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all those who have tuned in and watched this episode. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do it without you. So please, keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news, concerns, and triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passions for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities. Your voices are essential, and we're here to amplify them. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, Stay talking.